Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is lecture 10F, where we're going to continue our consideration of aneuploidies and of sex chromosome aneuploidies in particular, this time thinking about the phenotypes associated with these aneuploidies and the causes of the phenotypes. We'll talk about Turner's syndrome, which is women who have only one X chromosome instead of the usual two. And we'll talk about Klinefelter syndrome, which is men who have two X chromosomes instead of the normal one. So we treat sex chromosome aneuploidies separately, partly because of special factors affecting how they originate, as we described in the last lecture, but also because of special factors affecting their phenotypic consequences. Um, Presence absence factors are different for the Y chromosome, and copy numbers are different for the X chromosome in normal people, and gene expression is different for the X chromosome. So all of these factors change the interplay between copy number that we see with um, autosomal aneuploidies. So the, the two common sex chromosome aneuploidies I'm going to discuss are Turner syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome. They're both quite common, 1 in 500 to 1 in 2,000. And the phenotypes are mild, and they're quite variable. Many of these people are not diagnosed um, until late in life because they're superficially, they're coping well with the minor problems caused by these diseases. Now, I don't have pictures of these people to show you, and I don't want to show you the kind of nasty clinical genetics textbook pictures that you sometimes see. But what I strongly recommend that you do is go to the module 10 page, look at the resources and readings list, and you'll find links to writings by people who actually have these syndromes. People with Turner, people with Kleinfelder syndrome, writing about their lives. And I strongly recommend that you read these to get real insight into the, the differences and the similarities of these people and the rest of us. So sex chromosomal aneuploidies, as I said, are well tolerated. They don't have severe defects. Um, and that's probably because the chromosomes differ normally. So lack of a Y chromosome is the normal state for females. And Cells already know how to deal with imbalances in the X chromosome. We have X inactivation. Importantly, um, X inactivation is controlled by the number of X chromosomes that are present, not by the presence of a Y chromosome. And you'll see why this is in, important in a few minutes when we discuss Klinefelter syndrome. So, here again is our um, chart of the frequency of these defects, these aneuploidies. And the number of aneuploidies is now back up to 5% because we're including the sex chromosome aneuploidies, which you can see are quite frequent, mainly because of the very high frequency of Turner syndrome. Now, you'll remember that we said that Turner syndrome was largely due to errors in the male. The numbers are 74% of all Turner syndrome cases arise because of non-disjunction in, in the father's meiosis. And this means that male meiosis must be dropping its X or Y chromosome. So the, the child got an X from its mother and they got nothing from their father nothing in the way of a uh, sex chromosome. And this must be very common to account for the very high frequency of Turner syndrome um, fetuses, um, even though they're almost all spontaneously aborted. And we'll discuss the explanation for this in a few minutes. Um, as you see, um, most of these um, aneuploidies survive well to birth. The proportions of the um, aneuploidies among live births and among, among spontaneously aborted fetuses is just about what you would expect for these two aneuploidies, the male aneuploidies. It's just about what you would expect by chance. Um, so they're not seriously harmful at all. Now first let's consider Turner syndrome. 
the frequency, as I said, is about 1 in 2,000 births, but it's much higher in embryos. It's actually more than 1 in 100 in embryos and fetuses, but most don't survive till birth. It's usually diagnosed in infancy or early childhood because there are some characteristic phenotypic differences. They're quite mild, um, slight sort of wider skin in the neck. It's called webbing of the neck. Differences, minor differences in the shape of, of um, the hands and the position of the ears. But they're, they're not really something that you would, you would pull out as being, this is a peculiar looking child. Um, the most dramatic physical normalities probably is a short stature. Women with Turner syndrome are usually quite short and they have very minor learning disabilities. But all of these features are very variable. This may be because um, of what's called mosaicism, that um, women with Turner syndrome often have, or found to have, some normal cells, some 46XX cells. And women with large numbers of 46XX cells may not be diagnosed with Turner's until puberty. Um, because the 46XX cells are providing more of the normal function. So these, these defects are very variable. Now, we do understand the cause of the short stature, why women with Turner syndrome are very short. Normally, they're now treated with growth hormone to help them grow to a normal size. Um, the cause of the short stature is a gene called Shocks, S H O X. And it's called Shocks because it's a member of what's called the Homeo Box family. These are regulatory proteins that regulate many other genes. In the case of the Shocks gene, it's on the X chromosome, but it's in the pseudoautosomal region. Remember, we talked about the pseudoautosomal region in Module 7 when we talked about how the X and Y chromosomes um, cope with meiosis, and we talked about it again briefly in the previous lecture. So the Shocks gene is in the pseudoautosomal region of the X chromosome, but because the pseudoautosomal regions are homologous between the X and Y chromosome and they cross over, the Shocks gene is also in the pseudoautosomal region of the Y chromosome. And it is not X inactivated in normal women with two X chromosomes. The pseudoautosomal regions are not normally X inactivated. So here's the question. How many copies of shocks do normal women and normal men express? And the answer is they express two copies. And that's because in men, in normal men, there's a copy on the Y chromosome and a copy on the X chromosome, and they're both expressed. In normal women, there are two X chromosomes, and because this pseudoautosomal region is not X inactivated, both copies are expressed. Now, supporting the hypothesis that differences in Shock's expression are responsible for short stature is that shock, the Shock's gene is known to be haploinsufficient. You'll remember we talked about haplosufficiency in the context of why we so often see that one, a wild type allele will be dominant to a defective allele. Um, that's true for haplosufficient alleles. For haploinsufficient alleles, a single functional copy is not enough to give the normal phenotype. In particular, a single functional copy of shocks is not sufficient for normal growth. And that's seen in no women with a normal karyotype, they have two X chromosomes, but one of their shocks alleles is defective, they have the same short stature as women with a Turner syndrome karyotype. Now, the cause of the fetal inviability may also have been found. Now, this is newer data. This is a 2014 paper, and 
you know, it's still new, but this is quite suggestive. Um, there's another gene in the pseudoautosomal region. It's got a long um, initial name, CSF2RA, and it's thought to be required not for growth of, not directly for growth of the embryo or for growth of the baby and child. It's required for function of the placenta. And this means that if it's not functioning properly, the placenta will not function and the fetus will die. So it's thought that the reason that so many Turner syndrome fetuses um, die and turn into miscarriages rather than growing into healthy women with reasonably healthy women with Turner syndrome is that in true aneuploidy, where all the cells are 45XO, true aneuploidy, the placenta does not function well, again, because this gene is similarly haploinsufficient. One copy is not enough, and the fetuses die. But some embryos, as we said, are mosaic. Their cells contain um, normal karyotypes, two X chromosomes. The particular hypothesis here is that if the placental cells are mosaic, this is very common for placental cells to have a, a somewhat different genotype than the embryo itself for things like aneuploidies, um, then the placenta will be able to function normally because it's mosaic. And this will allow the fetus to survive. Normally, then, we expect that women with Turner syndrome would probably also be a little bit mosaic themselves. But this can be quite hard to detect unless a very careful search is made of all the different tissues to see if there are cells with normal karyotypes. But there will probably be more data on this issue soon. Now, what about the men? What about Klinefelter syndrome? Here, the karyotype the set of chromosomes is written as 47 XXY. They've got 47 chromosomes because they've got one more X chromosome than a normal man would have. This is more common than Turner syndrome, frequency of about 1 in 500 births. And men with Turner syndrome are usually very nearly normal. Um, they are usually tall. They have some minor learning disabilities. Often, Turner syndrome isn't diagnosed until puberty or until adulthood or never. It's thought to be quite seriously underdiagnosed. So many men only learn when they're unable to have children because men with Turner syndrome, sorry, men with Klinefelder syndrome are typically sterile. And a number of men only learn when they're unable to have children that it's because they have Klinefelder syndrome. Again, the phenotype is very variable. Now, again, also, the cause of the tall stature of Klinefelter syndrome is now thought to be understood, and it's the same explanation as the explanation for the short stature in women with Turner syndrome. That is, it's dosage of the shocks gene. Now, I said um, earlier that X inactivation is controlled by the number of X chromosomes that are present. If there's only one X chromosome present, it doesn't get inactivated, which is good because we'd be in trouble. If there's two X chromosomes present, one gets inactivated. And that's independent about whether or not there's also a Y chromosome present. So in 47 XXY men, men with two X chromosomes, one of their chromosomes is typically inactivated, just as it would be in a woman. This is very important and is a major part of the reason that men with an extra chromosome have a largely normal phenotype. It's because the dosage of most of the genes on their extra X chromosome is normal because their extra X chromosome has been inactivated. But because shocks, the shocks gene is pseudoautosomal, it's not inactivated. And so men with two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome have their 
shocks gene on their Y, and they have two shocks genes on their two X chromosomes, all being expressed. They have three active copies, and that makes them taller than normal men. And again, um, women who have three X chromosomes are, as we said, fairly normal because in women with three X chromosomes, two of those X chromosomes are inactivated. Again, they're fairly normal, but they also have three doses of the Shox gene, and they have the same tall phenotype as men with Klinefelter syndrome. So here's a problem for you to puzzle through. Given information about which parent women with Turner syndrome got their X chromosome from, and which parent men with Klinefelter syndrome got an X from, can you figure out which parent's meiosis made the error? And the answer is, the errors were in the paternal meiosis. You might have said this just because you remember that I told you that most errors were in the paternal meiosis. But it's more challenging to figure it out directly. If here, if the woman with Turner syndrome got their 1X chromosome from their mother, that means they didn't get anything from their father. Therefore, the error must have been in the paternal meiosis. If Men, normal men, don't get any X chromosome from their father. They only get a Y chromosome. So if they got an X chromosome as well as a Y chromosome from their father, that also must have been due to a meiotic error in the paternal meiosis. So we've considered two common syndromes, Turner syndrome and Klinefelter syndrome. And the nice thing is that we now have molecular understanding of at least part of the phenotypes associated with the syndromes. The stature phenotypes in both syndromes are thought to be caused by abnormal levels of expression of a gene controlling height. Um, not enough of it in women with Turner syndrome, too much of it in women with Klinefelter syndrome. Explained because the pseudoautosomal regions do not get X inactivated. And we analyzed evidence for parent of origin, which is the kind of analysis that underlies the conclusion that most of the meiotic errors responsible for these syndromes happened in the male parent, not in the mother. Coming up next, we're going to switch to thinking about chromosomal rearrangements. I hope to see you there.